Hi there. Welcome back to Subversive Preacher. My name is Cameron Miller, and this is a sermon reflection for the second Sunday of Easter season. Um, and the readings pointed for today, at least the ones I'm using, are uh, the Gospel of John, the Doubting Thomas story, which is chapter 20, verses 19 through 31, and also a poem by Mary Oliver entitled, Mysteries, Yes. So if you've read that story about John, from John, and the Doubting Thomas story, you'll see right away what he's done there. It's very clever, I'll give him that. He said, John writes, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. <laughs> now remember, the gospel is not a court recorder's verbatim version of how things went down in the first century. Rather, this is John improvising on the lips of Jesus. Those of us who need proof, who need to put our fingers in the nail holes, are not blessed according to John. He wants us to believe what he tells us. Hmm. Instead, this year, I am staring, as I stare at the, the story from Thomas, I decided to look at the, all four Gospels and see what stories each of the storytellers uh, decided to place right after the Easter Day empty tomb story. Interesting. Jesus' first post-tomb appearance in John, is the one we heard today, appearing to the disciples who are hiding for fear that they might be arrested, Thomas, of course, becomes the foil of that story. Now, Matthew has Jesus meeting his disciples on a mountain in Galilee, which is a place that had been prearranged. Um, and he tells, the, he tells the women at the tomb that he wants the disciples to meet him there. Uh, and it's there that Jesus gives those disciples their marching orders. Luke has the road to Emmaus story in which Jesus appears but he's unrecognizable to some travelers who had just witnessed the crucifixion. And only when they break bread together that evening do they recognize that it's Jesus. Now Mark, Mark the first of the stories told, the first of the four stories told, has no appearance uh, of Jesus. No post-empty tomb appearance of Jesus because it's an empty tomb. It ends with the empty tomb and a young man sitting in there who tells the women uh, to tell the disciples that Jesus has risen and is uh, going to meet them in Galilee, just like in the Gospel of Matthew. But in the end, the, it says that the women run away and say nothing to anyone because they're afraid. Now there's another ending to Mark. But there is consensus among mainline scholarship that it's a later ending added uh, by unknown sources, not by Mark. They are verses that the Christian snake handlers, by the way, get their ritual from. So though these are different stories with different characters and different settings, there's a common theme. They're looking forward, not backwards. They're looking ahead to where Jesus will or does meet them, and they are concerned with connecting Jesus with the future community. So ponder that with me for just a moment. Can you imagine 2,000 years into the future what humankind would be like? I can't, at least not with any sense that I can really imagine it with any sort of accuracy. I mean, we, we could just as easily be living in caves again as we might be synced with AI and a totally new species. Who knows? So do you think that John and Matthew and Luke and Mark had any notion that the Jesus movement that they were part of could or would become what it is? Surely they could not have imagined a megachurch of one million people in Seoul, South Korea or an amplified, music-filled Pentecostal tent meeting in Central Park. None of this, none of this stuff that we do, even though some of it is patterned after what we think they did, would be recognizable to them. I mean, our, our wafers and shot glasses are a far cry from a dinner table in someone's home or in an underground hideaway. <clears throat> 
Imagine Jesus saying to Thomas, when I look, Thomas, 2,000 years from now, there will be stone buildings as big as the Jerusalem temple all over the world, full of high priests and scribes who, with volunteers counting the collection plates in the back rooms. Not only that, someone will be playing an instrument louder than any natural noise known to us, while some people in strange robes will stand together and sing while everyone else is lined up in neat rows pretending to sing. <clears throat> Thomas would have found that as unbelievable as sticking his fingers in the nail holes. So here's, here's what I know. There are myriad ways to have faith. Some people, unbelievable to me, will believe something just because the right person or the right book has said that it's true. There are other people who, if they imagine it, believe it. Still others conjure up what they wish to be true and then embrace it as truth. Some of us are experiential learners. We're hard-headed and we can only accept what we've experienced ourselves. Still others want proof of whatever they are told and it must be independently verified by the scientific method. Christian orthodoxy of various kinds whether Orthodox with a capital O or Protestant and Roman Catholic Orthodoxy, has traveled a very, very long way upon its own authority. It has proclaimed and received as truth based upon its own authority to claim that it's true. And that's worked for 2,000 years. It still works for some people. But then there's the Thomas and those of us who are like Thomas. We need to see it and to touch it and to feel it and to hold it and to smell it and to talk to it. Better yet, to laugh and cry with it. I think that's why so many people will say they connect best to God or the sacred through nature. Nature evokes awe and awe opens a window in our heart for the holy to blow in. We can touch the transcendent in the majesty or, or exquisite beauty of nature. We can, we can feel it, we can smell it, we can hear it. Some of us need that, while others can apprehend the sacred on the back of a compelling idea. Boom! An aha experience. So there's nothing I can say to add to the obvious. We all come to this thing in different ways and with different means of opening to it. It shouldn't need to be said, but obviously given what all of us have encountered in organized religion at one time or another, it does need to be said. And as Mary Oliver wrote, truly we live with mysteries too marvelous to understand how grass can be nourishing in the mouth of lamb. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity while we ourselves dream of rising. Let me, let me keep company always with those who say, look, and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. On this second Sunday of Easter season, let's remind ourselves that we all come to this mystery with hearts and minds that work somewhat differently. And we need a variety of ways to be nurtured. If we can remember that, the community will prosper. Thanks for being here and peace be with you.